morning so far how about you good <laughs> it's early <laughs> good morning all is it just me or did the alarm go off really early this morning I don't know why but it seemed earlier than normal hmm? true <laughs> well believe it or not though we've already reached the end of the winter quarter which means springs right around the quarter or corner right yeah. well not so much in Alaska but we'll on the calendar it will be but today we're gonna conclude with the book of Exodus covering the last five chapters, um, but as normal, we'll start off with a short review from last week. Last week we talked about how um, while Moses was away for 40 days on Mount Sinai, the people, the Israelites, went to Aaron and requested new gods to guide them. They weren't sure if Moses was going to come back or what. They grew impatient, so they requested new gods to guide them. So Aaron, it seems that he didn't resist at all. He's like, okay, give me all your earrings. And he quickly fashioned uh, a golden bull. Um, so, and then once he went a step further, and that once he had completed the calf idol, he then built an altar and then called for a festival for the next day. And we're told that the people ate and drank and engaged in all sorts of frivolity. So knowing this was happen, happening, uh, God told Moses to leave the mountain and to go down to the people. And God then threatened to punish the people for their rebellion by destroying them and building a new nation with Moses as his patriarch. But Moses, showing love for his people, reminded God of all that he had done for them. Moses acknowledged that the people were rebellious, but he also pointed out they were God's chosen people. So Moses then pleaded for God's mercy. We're told that 3,000 Israelites were struck down as a result of this behavior. Moses confessed that what the Israelites had done was a great sin, and yet he begged for God to forgive them. So God promised to punish only those who had actually sinned against him. In our application last week, we, we talked about how God said that he was going to wipe the Israelites off the face of the earth. But how Moses, he was convinced that God was going to do this. He was convinced in his mind that God was going to do as he said he was going to do, which makes sense. So at that point, Moses offered up an immediate and extremely intense prayer. And as a result of that prayer, God changed his mind and decided not to destroy the Israelites. We then talked about how prayer is a powerful force. The Bible tells us that. All our religious lives, we, lives, we've been told that we can change things through prayer. But then sometimes in the back of our minds, there's this nagging suspicion that maybe our prayers really don't matter all that much. But we've been given authority, permission to plead with God to alter his will to meet our needs and desires. That's what prayer is all about. And we've been given that privilege because we belong to him. John 14, 4 from last week, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. When you and I pray, we are entering the presence of God with our requests. When you and I pray, we can pray with confidence. We can boldly come before God with the knowledge that we have authority to petition him. 
For our scheduled text today, we're going to be in chapters 35 through 40. And mainly we're going to focus on chapter 39 and then 40. Uh, In 35 through early parts of 39, uh, with the covenant renewed, Moses reminded the people to observe the Sabbath. Uh, He then instructed the Israelites to begin construction on the tabernacle, the structure that would become the heart of Israel's religious system for centuries. Um, The instructions for creating the tabernacle or putting it together um, were the same instructions that God had given to Moses earlier. And in these chapters, Moses simply passed those instructions on to the Israelites. Uh, So that's why we're not going to spend a lot of time in those chapters. But as we go into chapter 39, verses 32 through 43, we'll start there reading that this morning. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was completed, and the sons of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. They brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, and all its furnishings, its clasps, its boards, its bars, and its pillars, its sockets, and the covering of ram skins dyed red, and the covering of porpoise skins, and the screening veil, the ark of the testimony, and its poles, and the mercy seat, the table, and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with the arrangement of lamps, and all its utensils, and the oil for the light and the gold altar, and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the veil for the doorway of the tent, the bronze altar and its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the laver and its stand, the hanging for the court, the hangings for the court, <clears throat> its pillars and its sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the equipment for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting. And there we go. The woven garments for ministering in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. So the sons of Israel did all the work according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And Moses examined all the work, and behold, they had done it, just as the Lord had commanded. This they had done. So Moses blessed them. No mention is given as to exactly how long, how many months it took for them to complete the structure and furnishings for the tabernacle. Um, Because the Israelites had arrived at Mount Sinai three months after leaving Egypt, they must have camped at the base of the mountain for eight to nine months. Moses spent roughly 80 days of that time on Mount Sinai, separated from the people. So this leaves nearly six months for gathering all the materials and the construction of the tabernacle's components. Most Bible scholars believe this construction took place from roughly September through March on our calendars. However long it took, the workers were careful. We read this. They were careful to build to the exact specifications that the Lord had provided. As the tabernacle reached completion, The artisans brought their work to Moses so he could inspect it. Uh, Because Moses had received the instructions for the tabernacle directly from God, it only makes sense that he would be the one to inspect everything, quality control, quality assurance, if you will. So we're told here in this text that Moses carefully inspected every plank, peg, every curtain, every post, every clasp, every crossbar, every base and basin, every garment, everything. He made sure that it met the specifications that were provided by God. Upon inspection, we see that Moses saw that the, the work that the artisans had done, it met specifications. It was as God had instructed. So he approved each part. Of course, if you think about it, Moses' approval was not unexpected since we realize that God himself had given the artisans their special abilities to do this work. So Moses pronounced his blessing because the Israelites had shown faithfulness 
in donating their, donating their time, their, their talents, their materials to construct the tabernacle. And knowing of all that material, and all the things that they were building, a lot of that was very hard and tedious work, but they did it. The eagerness which which they had given themselves to the task revealed the, the quality of the finished product. In his blessing, Moses may have prayed that the people would prosper in all their undertakings and that they would be delivered from future evils. It was quite common in that time for requests like that to come through in benedictions. As we move out of chapter 39 and into 40, we read how God actually instructs Moses to set up the tabernacle. With all these components gathered and completed, God announces to Moses that the time had come to actually set it up. So about a year after the Israelites had left Egypt, on the first day of the first month, the Israelites erected the tabernacle. The Israelites had departed from Egypt on the 14th day of the first month of the first year, and the tabernacle was erected on the New Year's Day of the second year, according to the sacred calendar. God said that the Ark of the Covenant should be the first thing to be placed inside the tabernacle once the structure was built. The Ark would be the most prominent object in the tabernacle, and as such, it was, set to be, was actually set in the most holy place. The Ark was considered to be God's throne. And we know from previous weeks how a thick curtain separated the most holy place from the holy place. Then, at that point, God instructed Moses to place all the other furnishings into the tabernacle in the following order. I should have thrown thrown that slide up earlier. Um, So, the table was to be placed in the holy place. On the table were set plates, dishes, and the bread of the presence. The lampstand was to be set directly across from the table in the holy place. The altar of incense was to be set at the head of the holy place, in front of the curtain entering the most holy place, and before the Ark of the Covenant. The altar of burnt offering was to be placed in the tabernacle courtyard so that it was the first thing an Israelite saw when entering the courtyard. And there's actually a courtyard there. The basin was to be placed between the altar and the entrance to the holy place so that the priests could ceremonially, could ceremonially cleanse themselves before going into the tabernacle. The courtyard, as we've discussed earlier, previous weeks, was to encompass 4,500 square feet around the tabernacle. To enter the courtyard, the Israelites were to walk through an open curtain at the east end of the complex. If I can do that without... I knew it. Every time. So, after giving his instructions on how to place the actual tabernacle items within the tabernacle, God told Moses to anoint the tabernacle and everything in it with the sacred anointing oil. And this act of uh, anointing signified that a person or thing was being set aside for God's purpose. That's what it meant. God said that once all the objects in the tabernacle had been sanctified, it would be time to sanctify the priests whose responsibility it was to administer to the tabernacle. So the Lord told Moses to bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tabernacle, to wash them, to put the specially made garments on them, and to anoint them so that they could initiate their priestly duties in verses 12 through 15. The components, as we've read, the components of the tabernacle were already completed. They were finished. God had given the furnishings in the tabernacle. All that was left for Moses was to actually build the tabernacle and follow through with God's instructions. And we're told that that is exactly what they did. We read here that the Israelites did not deviate in any direction. They did exactly as God had told Moses to tell them to do. They followed instructions. In fact, eight times in chapter 40, Moses is said to have done exactly 
what the Lord had commanded them to do. Just as the Lord had commanded them to do, Moses followed a specific order as he erected the tabernacle, putting the furnishings in place, and ceremonially, ceremonially washing himself. So as Moses went to set up each of the tabernacle furnishings, he used that item according to its specified purpose. After he set up the table, for example, he set out 12 loaves of bread on it. After he set up the lampstand, he placed the lamps on it. After he set up the altar, he burned sweet incense in it. After he set up the altar of burnt offering, we're told he offered burnt offerings and grain offerings. After he set up the basin for washing, he washed his hands and feet and ordered Aaron and his sons to do, to do the same. Again, great detail is given in chapter 40 of the specific steps that they followed, and they were the steps that God had told them to do. In that Aaron and his sons had not yet officially been installed in the priesthood, Moses appeared to function as a high priest here. He was the one that God used to lead the people out of Egypt. We all know this. He was the one to whom God gave the law. He was the one whom God told to build the tabernacle. He was functioning as such as a high priest. Now Moses was the one to first burn incense and offer burnt sacrifices in the new tabernacle, something that thereafter only priests could do. Later on in chapter 40, verses 34 through 38, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire in it by night, in the sight of all of the house of Israel. Whoops, too far. So, after the tabernacle was completed and the first offerings to the Lord had been sacrificed, the cloud that we know of as the glory of the Lord descended and covered the tent. As, as if to say he was pleased with the artisan's work, the Lord filled the tabernacle with his presence in verse 34. All the Israelites, including Moses, uh, they took note of the transformation that had taken place, and knowing that the glory of God was in the tabernacle, Moses realized that not even himself, that he could not even enter it at that time. Until a tabernacle was built in the promised land, it would be in this tent of meeting that God would dwell among his people. God's instituting the tabernacle and as, as his dwelling place was a direct fulfillment of his earlier promise to Moses when he said, I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. Chapter 29, verse 45 of Exodus. The tabernacle, as we remember from previous weeks, it op occupied a central position, central location in the community both religiously and literally, as we have discussed. It was, it was the center point of their worship, and the tents of the 12 tribes were pitched around it. The cloud of glory that descended onto the tabernacle apparently later drew back into the most holy place, as we read, and there it dwelt above the outspread wings of the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. Thus, Moses and later the priests could actually enter the holy place and perform their services without being overcome by the glory of God, which remained back behind a thick curtain of the most holy place. So though God now dwelt among his people in the tabernacle, the people still could not go directly into God's presence in the most holy place. A barrier still existed a thick curtain 
And this was something that was necessary, um, quite simply because of the people's uncleanliness. The curtain was lifted only once a year when the high priest entered the most holy place and sprinkled the blood of atonement on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant to make expiation for the sins of the Israelites. As we see that, that it, what happened there with the ark being behind the thick veil, thick curtain, we can draw the conclusion or draw the similar situation with us as Christians now under the new covenant, how we actually have direct access to God. When Christ was crucified on the cross, the curtain of the temple, we read, was torn down, or is torn in tow from the top to the bottom, Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. Therefore, because of Christ, the barrier between ourselves and God had been eliminated. God, through his Holy Spirit, is now present within all believers. So, the book of Exodus, it really, it, it ends on a positive note here. Um, in previous weeks, we've, we've seen all kinds of negative things. Uh, people dying, um, the plagues, just all this negative all these negative things, but here at the end, we see how the Israelites, led by Moses, had accomplished what God wanted them to do, and they had done it right. The same cloud that had guided the Israelites when they had left the encampment at Succoth now dwelled among them perpetually in the tabernacle, leading them step by step onto the promised land. Um, Whenever the cloud of God's presence lifted, the tabernacle was moved, and the Israelites would set out, traveling wherever the cloud would leave them. But if the cloud did not move from the tabernacle, the Israelites stayed put. Very clear instructions, very easy for us to even understand that, that if the cloud didn't move, they didn't move. They followed instructions. God was leading them. God had kept his promise to Moses. His presence went with the Israelites, guiding them as a cloud by day and as a fire by night. And he guided them to the land that the Lord had promised to Abraham. So, how can we wrap this up in some sort of an application for us now? In doing that, I'd like to just talk about more details of the tabernacle itself. I read a story about a preacher who traveled to Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. Uh, it's a famous town which, was, which has lots of restored buildings from the 1700s. There are shops there, restaurants, governor's mansion, but there's an Episcopalian church building constructed in 1715 that still has regular worship services. It is called Bruton Parish, and it's a beautiful structure. On, there are pews with plaques with the names of some famous people that have attended there, including George Washington, James Madison, Patrick Henry, and Thomas Jefferson. But what caught this preacher's eye was how the sanctuary was laid out. The pulpit was way up high, a good 10 feet off the main floor, so the preacher had to climb up a set of stairs to preach. That could be really dangerous with Mike. We don't want him falling. This little hole up here gives him enough trouble. But, and the pews had doors on the end so you could trap people in there. I mean, it was interesting design, but the most significant thing to him was that the seating, how the seating was actually divided, and you can see it in the image there. It was divided into four sections so that the aisles formed a cross. The design was deliberate. 
It's called a cruciform or a cross design. The builders of this building intended to communicate that their faith was based on the cross by how their building was constructed. In previous weeks, we've talked about how the tabernacle was a very unique structure. And just as a sanctuary at Bruton Parish was deliberately designed to teach its people something, so was the tabernacle. There were many heavenly lessons God wanted to teach his people through that tabernacle. One of the lessons God wanted to teach was that God wanted to be in the midst of his people. The tabernacle was situated right in the middle of the encampment. We remember this. When the tabernacle was set up, the nation of Israel surrounded it. Right in the middle of them was God's tent, his tabernacle. But even when the people moved from place to place, the tabernacle uh, then had to be moved. But even then, when it was moved, God's tabernacle was at the center of the people because of the order in which they marched. God was always in their midst. That's the way it was designed. God always met their needs, providing food and water. When the tabernacle was set up, its its very design was such that it could teach deep truths. Yes, God was in the midst of his people, but he was separated from them because of their sin. There was a fence, there was a gate, a door, and a veil. And each of these was an obstacle between God and Israel. The only way that God's people could approach him was by sacrifice, right as it came in the gate. The only way that they could stay close was by continual cleansing. The outer court represented judgment. This is where the sacrifices took place. This is where the innocent animals died for the sins of men. And the bronze that encased the altar and the brazen lever, lever, that metal represented judgment. But once a priest stepped inside the tabernacle itself, there wasn't anything made of bronze. At that point, everything was made of gold. Gold was the metal of royalty or a king. When Jesus was born, the wise men brought their gifts. The first was gold. Jesus was born to be a king. And the smell was different, too. Outside, you can imagine, with all the sacrifices, there was the smell of death. Inside, there was the smell of bread and of incense and lamp oil. It smelled like life. The Bible tells us that once we become Christians, we have an aroma too. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 15 and 16. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For those who are under judgment... Those who are outside, if you will, into the courtyard, there's, we are the smell of death. We as Christians are the smell of death. But for those who have surrendered their lives to Christ, who have come into God's presence with us, we are the smell of life and hope. Now, as we've said before, the bronze of the outer court represented judgment, and now the gold of the inner rooms represented royalty. But there's a third metal used in the tabernacle. It wasn't as obvious as the bronze and the gold because it wasn't used in the furniture. No, this metal, it actually held the tabernacle together, and it formed the foundations of the posts that held up the fence of the outer court. And it formed the foundation of the boards that shaped the walls of the tabernacle. 
And what was this metal? This metal was silver. Silver was the metal that was commonly used for currency. When you bought or sold or redeemed something in that culture, you most likely used silver. When Jesus was betrayed, remember he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And whereas bronze stood for judgment in the tabernacle and the gold stood for royalty, silver was a medal of redemption. The tabernacle rested on the medal of redemption. Numbers chapter 18, verse 16 tells us that when a firstborn son was a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver. God was telling his people that their relationship with him was founded or based upon him redeeming them. And so also our entire relationship with God rests on the price of redemption paid by Christ. But he didn't purchase us with silver or gold. As we know, he purchased us with his own precious blood. Okay, so the tabernacle was a beautiful place of worship on the inside. Inside, there were bright colors, blue and purple. There was gold. The furniture was encased in gold plate, and there was embroidery, polished wood on the walls. Inside the tabernacle, beauty was everywhere. But on the outside, it wasn't all that pretty. On the outside, you'd see the skin of badgers. If you've seen badgers, you know that they're not a very attractive animal. And they're not that large. So to make a covering large enough to go over the tabernacle would have required many skins. And together, sewn together, it would really look like kind of a patchwork. For all intents and purposes, the, the tabernacle appeared to be nothing more than a large black tent. It probably was not very appealing to the eye from the outside. But then the tabernacle we're told, represented Jesus Christ. And Isaiah tells us that he didn't have earthly beauty. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2 declares, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. When Jesus walked among men, he wasn't high and mighty. He walked on level ground, the people he ministered to. And people weren't drawn to him because he was very attractive. They were drawn to him because he loved and cared for them, and he ministered to their needs. The last thing we should notice about the tabernacle is how it was actually laid out. As you notice from this picture, the layout of the tabernacle furnishings began at the altar of sacrifice, from right to left, goes to the brazen laver, then into the holy place with the tabernacle of showbread, lampstand, altar of incense, and lastly, to the Ark of the Covenant. Every time the tabernacle was set up, it was set up with this arrangement. It never changed. In the 600 years or so that Israel worshipped at this tabernacle, it was always the same. In this earthly tabernacle, God taught us, taught an ultimate heavenly truth. And it shows the cross shape in the furniture's positionings by surprise. It, it, as you walk through it, if you have time, I'd actually recommend you go on and look at some of the uh, 3D animations uh, people have done of uh, the courtyard and the tabernacle. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, but the layout symbolizes a cross. In order to get to God, man not, mankind needed to go through the cross. 
Colossians 1, verses 19 and 20 tells us, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. In his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, Philip Yancey notes that other world religions are known for their brightly painted images and gilded statues. But at the center of Christianity rests this cross, simple, stark, and solitary. Yancey asked, what possessed Christians to seize upon this execution device as a symbol for faith. Why not do everything within our power to squelch the memory of the scandalous injustice? Why make it the centerpiece of the faith? Of all the symbols of hope and triumph, the cross is indeed the most ironic. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But of course, that had always been the plan of God. Where some religions worship idols and glory in their statues, God intended us to build our relationship to him around the constant reminder that our forgiveness was bought by an innocent sacrifice on a cruel cross, by a God who willingly paid the price to redeem us. And that is an application that we can draw from a story from so long ago that would seemingly have nothing to do with us today. A large tent that just, why do we need to know all these details? Why was so much time spent on explaining exactly how things were to be constructed and laid out? Because it is important to us. It all points to Jesus. And that is where we'll close up our study of Exodus. Um, Spring quarter begins next week, and in the auditorium you'll have all the classes will be talking about 1 Corinthians. You'll have the little card in the pew in front of you. I hope you'll continue to make it to classes. Ed Tracy will be here in the auditorium talking about 1 Corinthians, and we'll have classes in 25, 26 as well with Scott Geyer and James Harris. I thank you for your time and coming this quarter, and hopefully as I learned a lot by going into Exodus again, I hope I was able to share some insight, some trigger something in your brain, hopefully to get you to learn something that you did not realize as well. Um, every time we go back through Scripture, you can find something else. There is... That is one of the undeniable truths. If you open yourself up to it and study it, you will find something else every time. Um, so I appreciate you being here with us. If you will, with, go with me as we bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for the time you've given us to come together to study your word. Lord, we often overlook the words from the Old Testament, but they truly do form the foundation for everything. And we realize through a thorough review and study of your word that, again, it all points to Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the detail that is provided to us. You make it very clear to us, Lord, if we only will spend time in your word, all will be revealed. Lord, please 
Give us that desire to want to study your word more. To read it daily, to meditate upon it. To make it a part of our lives. Lord, I thank you for those that have been attending this Bible class, whether it be here in person or streaming. I pray that, like me, they have gained some insight into the, the stories from Exodus and the, the travels of the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Lord, how you guided them how you showed mercy on them, how you provided for them, even though they were a a stubborn, stiff-necked, and sometimes weak people. Lord, we realize that we are stubborn, we are stiff-necked, and we are weak. We pray that you'll have your mercy on us, that you'll forgive us when we do wrong, and that you will always guide us. And ultimately, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice he made on our behalf so that we may have hope of being with you one day in heaven. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.